the overall budget deficit is approaching 8% of GDP. Given the rise in interest rates, for this reason alone, if not others, the deficit is on an upward trend. And just elected, the new administration agreed with Congress for a 1.5% of GDP equivalent increase in expenditures. The agreement busted the fiscal anchor. There is the promise of a new fiscal rule, and there is hope that the 30-year-old promise of a basic tax reform will be approved. Thanks so much, Paolo, Drauzio, Simone, um, the Chamber. It's, it's always a pleasure to be here, um, take part, listening to incredible discussions and take being, being part of a, of a great uh, panel. And here I'm speaking about my colleagues, <coughs> um, co-panelists. So, um, the goal to reattain investment grade by 2026. Um, we'll start off with that. Let's see where Brazil is on on the comparative sense on on the on the rating picture. So if we step back. Um, S and P has over 130 sovereigns rated. In Latam Caribbean, we have about 27. And 10 of those are investment grade, the remaining 17 are spec grade. Brazil is in the spec grade category. So that is where the majority of our ratings stand. Um, and, and it is rated double B minus with a stable outlook. And it's been at that rating level since our last downgrade in the beginning of 2018. And this was ahead of, those elect of the, the, that year's elections and a sense that the inability to advance challenging fiscal legislation um, with deficits at that point in time, 10-ish percent of GDP, what have you, overall deficits, inability to push forward social security reform, the spending ceiling had been passed. And we just felt, you know, at th that time, after so many years of um, lack of progress, we kind of, we weakened our institutional assessment. So <clears throat> I would say, if, you know, if we're looking at turning Brazil's rating story around, the two prominent weaknesses are the fiscal and the growth story. <clears throat> and Brazil's growth has not differed over the past 20 years that much than Mexico's. Both are just for low growers. Turning that around in Brazil's case is key. If we think of rating like Uruguay, who default, which defaulted and then regained investment grade. And this is where I'm going to draw some comparisons here. Uruguay turned around its growth dynamics. It separated itself to try to insulate policy, policies to insulate its growth linkages with Argentina, and it grew has grown fairly solidly to not buoyant but very solidly, and that has been a key component of its turnaround and its um, ratings trajectory, and it reattained investment grade, it's currently rated triple B. That the spending cap on its own is not sufficient. Social Security form advanced under Bolsonaro, but, and, it, and it's, you know, it's Social Security spending from the private sector is down from close to nine to close to eight, but that's still significant, all right? So there are challenges in the, in, in, in inside the fiscal accounts, and that is key. The debt composition remains solid, as Paolo highlighted. But there are other off-budget spending um, aspects that have, that have come in, uh, come on increasingly, the precatorios, and we look at that as a weight on the fiscal outlook as well. Notwithstanding strong performance last year and the prior year in terms of deficits moving below 5% of GDP and this last year primary surplus, we do expect that to turn around because of the factors that Paolo highlighted. So we see the fiscal deficit trajectory rising and the growth and, and the debt to GDP trajectory rising. We're at double B minus, key external strengths, the fiscal is weak, but the composition of the debt is solid. But a question mark, if backtracking on certain policies, be it on the regulatory front, questions of management of state-owned enterprises, questions of management of monetary policy, if that starts to in, uh, contaminate the strengths in the composition of the government debt and or volatility, th these are risks we would see to the downside. On the flip side, Brazil is so well placed in the global climate. You've had, had a lot of deregulation that went into effect. 
during the Bolsonaro administration, strengthening an infrastructure, ports, etc. There is, there, could there be an upside in growth moving forward because of some strengths and infrastructure improvements, as well as the, the, the endowment that Brazil has and, and its place in the global climate? Assuming you can anchor expectations, um, I think the fiscal is key that could feed into a better, you know, a stronger investment sentiment and growth dynamics. That's key, I think, for the upside of the rating. The sense that growth will be more, doesn't have to be booming, but it's going to be solid and robust. And that's where you would see the upside from coming from Brazil's rings. And it will, going back, concluding with investment grade, it will take time, no matter what. You know, we've, it, it depends on from country to country, but it could be, you know, um, five more plus more, more years depending, you know, the track record follow through is key. That five years is sort of like a, giving an average of some of the, the paths from other countries that have been in sub-investment grade, regaining investment grade. That's not a prediction, I want to highlight that. Uh, hi, thanks for having me. When I expected from Lula elected was uh, what we call the pragmatic Lula. The pragmatic Lula, is someone who doesn't like the market, but sees the market as a constraint. So it says, oh, market, I, I don't like it. Bunch of rich guys, they don't do anything good for society, but I better uh, respect it uh, for my own good. Uh, so I have to, to follow this fiscal responsibility thing and do a, a very, very well done budget uh, so that I'm not punished by it. Then in the November, I was very surprised with the, the Lula that came it was not the pragmatic Lula. I, I would say it was something more like a messianic Lula, it was a guy who was coming and saying, I don't need to follow markets. I'm the man. Obama told me I'm the man. I'm the man. I can do whatever I want. My presence by itself is going to make Brazil grow. I don't need to show. I already have a lot of reputation. And what he did, he did two things. One thing he chose for the finance minister, Adaji, I, I like the guy personally, but he has a pretty bad reputation in the market. And reputation means a lot. It's hard to convince someone when you have a past that you didn't follow some rules. And besides choosing Adaji, that was the worst possible scenario. Nobody thought of it in the markets. He did that packet, that waiver with $170 billion of expenditure next year, this year. And the pragmatic Lula will do only 70 billion, not 170. And my take is that by doing these two things, choosing Adadi and spending 170 billion, he crossed the line. He's in a position that he's not gonna be able to do anymore, a return to try to increase taxes and try to balance, kind of balance the debt. So uh, type of numbers that I have, he needs at least 2% of GDP of primary surplus. So that, that grows, but doesn't grow too much. And I think market's gonna take if it grows slowly, but he's starting from a 1% deficit. He needs 3% of GDP of extra taxes. I don't think that he can do it. I think it's totally impossible to do it unless you have a crisis. So I think we're going for a fiscal crisis. That's the, the basic scenario that I have, very different from what Lisa said. So Lisa's considering investment grade and I'm saying, no, basic scenario is fiscal crisis. What do I mean by fiscal crisis and how are we gonna get there? What I mean by fiscal crisis is very different prices like those that we had before. So I don't, I don't mean we're gonna go and become uh, Venezuela or Argentina. What I mean by fiscal crisis is that you have a BRL depreciation. So dollar goes up a lot, maybe, six, uh, the long part of the curve, the back part of the interest rate curve goes up a lot. If you think the real rate in 50 years, NTNB, that is like 6%, six and a half percent real, it has to go maybe to seven and a half, eight. Uh, the stock prices, the equity has to go down a lot. And after you have that, uh, Congress accepts mostly uh, anything. No, thank you. Thank you very much, Paulo and Brazil and Champ for the invitation. It's a great honor to be here. Uh, although we are 
very concerned as well uh, on the fiscal. I have to say that I do see room for the central bank to cut rates this year, and I do not see uh, a fiscal crisis uh, in the near term. But let me, uh, before I get there, I think that first thing, when we talk about Brazil and especially the outlook for 2023, I think that it's important to have in context the global context, right? We are in a scenario of a global disinflation after a couple of years of extremely high inflation, in particular in the US. Uh, the China reopening story has been also a, a very important uh, driver uh, for the markets and for the global economy this year. There's still some doubts about the end result of that, if it's going to be higher inflation because of increased higher global inflation because of the increase in global demand, or we could see this more immaculate uh, disinflation scenario. You're normalizing some of the supply chains uh, that were hurt during the pandemic, uh, but still a lot of uncertainty in the global scenario, I think that this is going to be, play a key role because I do agree uh, with Fabio that there is some kind of in the joinity here between uh, the global outlook and how and the market prices and the government actions. I think that does the market still puts a constraint uh, on the policy decisions here and uh, the jury's still out whether we are going to have this immaculate disinflation or we can where, where uh, we could have a scenario of a global recession. Uh, on the growth side, 2022 <coughs> much better than what we expected. Uh, but uh, we, I think that we have already very clear signals that there was a deceleration in the second half of the year. Uh, I do expect actually uh, growth to have dropped in the fourth quarter and to keep in the negative camp in the first half of the year. So I think that will contribute uh, on the inflation outlook. Uh, it's important to say that the central bank at their last meeting, and they have been saying that for a while, that they would persist on the strategy to keep rates stable at 1375, very high level, uh, even when we compare uh, real rates, until they see, one, that the disinflationary process is consolidated, uh, and two, if inflation expectations is anchored around its targets. I think that on the first condition, uh, the fundamentals are more uh, are aligned to for those conditions to be met at some point uh, by mid of the year. Uh, on the growth side, the labor market is already pulling off. We do see employment decreasing at the last three months. Uh, credit numbers are a huge challenge, and you, everyone saw uh, the events. Uh, of a big retailer uh, last week, but I think that's on the top of that. It's not uh, when we look at the leverage of the households and the cumulative increase on interest rates, definitely there's going to be a significant slowdown, increasing the interest rates. I think that we already have uh, signals of that is starting to happen given the lacks uh, of monetary policy. On the inflation front, we did see a decrease in the headline, first driven mostly by tax cuts. But then uh, I think that uh, when we look at the core uh, of the global store, the normalization of supply chains, we already seen core goods in the US uh, falling. I think that there are still some downward trend here. And services as well is starting to cooling off. It's still at very high level, so too soon. Uh, to take this as warranted, uh, important for the central bank to keep in rates. But then uh, I think that those conditions in terms of the fundamentals for the disinflationary process are, are going to be met. Thank you, Paulo. First and foremost, it's a tremendous pleasure to be here, uh, as always, um, and particularly with such a, a distinguished panel of, of friends. When, it kind of, when I look at the kind of the policy, the quality of policy making, the political environment and uh, and the potential speed at which of decisions from this new administration could continue to undermine kind of you know uh, growth prospects and macroeconomic stability. 
I am not as worried about the next six to 12 months, um, uh, but I am more worried about the policy environment uh, at the end of this year, heading into the second year of, of, of Lula's administration. Um, I, I see that this administration uh, will make some constructive overtures on a couple different fronts, an economic team that will try to anchor expectations, will try to make some progress on, on kind of reducing that fiscal gap that both Fabio and Cassina talked about. Um, I do think that a, a version of a higher kind of tax take will come this year before any potential crisis. Um, I, uh, uh, you know, the fiscal rule, of course, will only be credible if you actually have credible signals of cutting expenditures and raising taxes. So a rule by itself may not, you know, do much good, but some effort will be made. And I see the administration approving kind of a comprehensive VAT tax reform, which I think is going to be the star of the reform agenda. I, I think conditions are ripe for approval in Congress. Uh, I see the administration moving aggressively in environmental policy. And I actually see the administration moving forward in our EU medical school trade agreement. Um, um, I think those things are important in this global environment of uh, shifting geopolitical tectonic plates and a very active discussion uh, over a number of companies trying to re redefine global supply chains um, and, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, and react to this environment. And, and, and the buzzwords of French shoring, near shoring, I think are on the boardrooms of many companies. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the, you know, the message here is, and the big qualifier is that this government needs growth, some version of growth and revenue to save the day. You need to have light at the end of the tunnel heading into 2024. Um, uh, and and uh, because we're in, a, in a, a political environment of a rotten public opinion kind of uh, backdrop, deeply polarized country, uh, 8 January will not unite the country, much like 6 January did not unite the country in the United States. The remedies that are taken to be able to avoid new episodes from occurring will probably deepen the, the levels of division that we're seeing in Brazil's uh, society. Uh, and that means that Lula has a relatively small cushion from a public opinion point of view. We're in an environment of weak governments. Um, and, and I fear, um, you know, kind of Lula's reaction function in an environment where growth is lackluster, inflation doesn't come down, and he's behind the eight ball from a public opinion point of view. Clearly, this is a different president. I think that this is a, I think that uh, Lula's pragmatic DNA has not gone away. I, I think it would be a mistake to say that it has been entirely gone away. But this is a president kind of emerged from the Lava Jato scandal, um, more suspicious. Um, you know, I think he feels that the economic elite that was, that was uh, uh, kissing up to him, abandoned him during the Lava Jato period. Um, he, he sees a, uh, a, a very difficult domestic political environment with a mobilized opposition from the Bolsonaro base intent on undermining him and democracy in the process without a valid adjustment that that is correct or not, but clearly that is the sentiment of the president. Uh, it's almost as if that he's preparing to go to battle. Uh, and and the, the repercussion of that was that he put people that he trusts um, of an intimate trust circle in key positions. Adagi, if you look at Glacia Hoffman, the PT, Mirka Danchi, Hui Costa, Pagidia. Interestingly, Vice President Jadu Alkeming has entered into the circle's trust. I think that is a constructive development. But I think that uh, the decision to nominate Adaj or people that he really trusts is not necessarily a decision for economic heterodoxy. It is a decision to be able to have very loyal people around him in what he views as a tough environment. I think that this government is on the bubble. Okay, um, you you could I, I could envision kind of a series of measures that signal higher growth, the global backdrop helping, making some progress on the fiscal, and then you end up getting into an equilibrium where the reaction function of the president isn't all that negative, and you're able to find a win set of anchoring expectations. Um, obviously, I'm not a macroeconomist. I can't tell you the, the you know if that's enough, but you know, alternatively, though, if that's not enough, the global backdrop doesn't help, Lula's popularity drops more aggressively in this polarized environment, then we're headed for choppy waters and the reaction function starts to deteriorate, right? So, so it is, um, uh, we, we look at all that and we have our balance, our tra trajectories at neutral. But anyway, um, I think that the next six months will be really critical to see which one of these two scenarios are we going to be headed toward. Uh, on the equity side, uh, I agree. I think that this is more of a micro story, if I'm right. And Chris, even more, more constructive on the tax reform, you have to do uh, the math uh, to see which uh, uh, 
company sector are going to be benefited uh, or not, all the valuations. And that's not uh, my speciality, so I'll not, I'll not uh, say uh, something more directly on that. But I think that, uh, and one thing is important, and Fabio already mentioned that there, there is this difference between what locals, how locals are seeing the government, and how foreigners uh, see. Uh, when you compare, and Lisa already touched that, you compare Brazil, uh, the numbers with other countries. Uh, this fiscal story, the debt stabilization concern, I think it, it's a global story. So uh, that, that's why uh, at, in the short term, the facts, even if not to see a lower FX value, I don't agree with the 480 uh, as a fair value, but looking at the carry that we have in terms of real rates, uh, definitely uh, a, a positive, uh, a positive bet if I were to be uh, a strategist. I'm a bit surprised, um, but not that surprised given uh, how locals uh, have um, um, traded the market in, in recent weeks that you will still like the currency. Um, there's, there's a lot that's going against the currency, it's just under uh, the radar. So we talk a lot about um, Brazil specifics, but uh, by and large, Brazil is a big commodity trade. And China's reopening is helping now. US markets are more uh, Nine, I would say, or positive because they see that the, the, the risk of inflation is behind us. The inflation goes up to eight. We know that that part we know well in Brazil. That's going to five four is not that hard. Going from five four to two is a lot harder. So we're all celebrating the eight to five, but I think we still have to go through the five to two, and uh, we'll see that more clearly in the second half of the year. So we are right now in an environment where people are celebrating the disinflation, growth won't be that bad in the US, China is reopening, the dollar is weakening, everything is good for the currency. And the locals who are there for very good reasons, as uh, Fabio laid out, they had to unwind their negative bets. But they have done a lot of that already. And we look at the disconnect between this speculative, benign backdrop and uh, negative flows, one of the worst starts in many years. Um, equity is very poor in uh, inflows and uh, mostly outflows actually altogether. If you look at the economy, it's thing to we'll probably see negative growth in the fourth quarter and probably in the first quarter, as Cassiano said. And the fact that um, you know, the half empty comes um, a bit later on, but not that much later on. I think in the second half we see the economy in the US and uh, in, in negative growth as well. So I think the, um, the BRL can be still a good uh, negative bet. The problem is timing. You don't want, no one wants to pay 13% uh, uh, to, you know, to wait. So, but I, I think it could be in the, under good policies. It could be 4.5. It could be strong. But, uh, the whole debate here is how bad it's going to be, not how nice the policies will be, you know, how, how contained it will be. No one is, is uh, painting a very positive scenario. So I would say that the, the PRL, I think that um, at these levels, because of the backdrop that's already so benign, there's so much uh, a good news priced in, I think could suffer as well. For Facebook, of course, because of growth, if um, or to be a, uh, a macro scenario, I think uh, the main casualties here are growth, so lower growth. High inflation, I think it's going to be difficult to, to deliver less than 6%. And uh, higher real rates, and um, that's uh, the price to pay for all this uncertainty that has been generated and the lack of fiscal anchors. And it is as simple as that. Having, having said that, I um, think there are two, I know that's cool, two important theorems in, in economics. First is that um, life goes on. So, so, so people who make widgets, they will come back tomorrow and continue to make widgets because that's what they do. So the economy is not going to tank. Uh, it's not the goal, not the plan that, uh, to, to tank on it. But of course, they'll make a little bit less. So I think uh, Lula probably benefits from, uh, with, uh, from China's growth in, in his first mandate. That added two, two points to, to Brazil growth back then. They don't acknowledge that, but that's true. Now we could add another half a point. So the consensus is half. 
was half from China to draw one, but the one is in the office and everything. But let's say it's not that bad, so life goes on. The other one is that um, the finance is a very sophisticated theory is that, that um, money doesn't take up use, right? There's a, that's a more polite version of it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, beggars cannot be choosers. We, we, we can, um, <coughs> the country has to borrow. Uh, at some point, they have to comply with the rules, right? It may take a crisis, a fiscal crisis, pressure. And I think it's easier to get that pressure when the world is not growing or the, the, the views are not as benign as they are now. So I don't have a, a, a timing view, but I think things get harder as uh, the year develops. Thank you very much. We've just passed 10.30. Uh, we certainly learned a lot. I'd like to thank our panelists for the excellent presentations and thank you all for coming. <laughs>